So thank you very much. Pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, first, I just want to start off by thanking all the sponsors we had for this research over the years. And I have no related financial disclosures about anything I'm going to be presenting to you today. But as was mentioned, I do, uh, let me see, I guess I need to get this out of the way because you probably can see that is my guess. Um, so uh, as uh, was mentioned in my introduction, I do work for the Centers for Disease Control. Uh, and I just need to mention that the statements in these talks are just my viewpoints and don't necessarily reflect those of, of your government or the CDC. So the need for ophthalmology on the front lines of medicine is pretty clear. Ophthalmologists and neuro-ophthalmologists obviously are not and, and can't be everywhere. And yet, the examination of the ocular fundus is a really important aspect on the front lines of medicine. Why is that? Well, we know that it can help us diagnose acute visual loss that needs urgent management. In this case, uh, you see a retinal detachment uh, that's uh, quickly approaching the macula that needs urgent surgical intervention. It can show a warning sign of a potential uh, visually impairing disease or one with neurologic complications. In this case, uh, both of those things. This is papilledema, uh, which is usually, as we use the term, to mean from increased intracranial pressure. So uh, this patient, though, has normal visual function. And but yet, if this condition goes on long enough, uh, may result in severe visual loss to the patient. Or, and, and more importantly, uh, for the patient's life, this could indicate uh, that there's something more serious going on, a, a colloid cyst in one of the ventricles, a brain tumor, all sorts of things uh, that might not otherwise uh, be captured in an acute visit. And finally, it helps us uh, diagnose the severity of certain medical conditions. In this case, this is very severe hypertensive retinopathy. And so we have evidence of end organ damage, and this is a situation that you all know needs to be taken seriously. We also know from several long-term uh, population-based studies that uh, retinal microvascular changes, those are uh, signs like arterial narrowing, exudates, cotton wool spots, microhemorrhages, other small, uh, other hemorrhages in the eye. In this case, this photograph shows uh, some arterial narrowing. Uh, these changes have been associated with with long-term cardiovascular and neurologic outcomes. So this can also play a role in telling our patients how they may do from a cardiovascular or neurologic standpoint. For example, the Blue Mountains Eye Study found that these retinal microvascular changes I just spoke about increase one's incident cardiovascular mortality by uh, two times. Uh, the Atherosclerosis Risk and Community Study, the ERIT study, found that retinal microvascular changes increase the six-year risk of stroke by two to three times. And many of these conditions can be diagnosed simply with a direct ophthalmoscope, which uh, was invented by, in 1850 by Hermann von Hemholtz. But the problem is this is an extremely difficult to use device, uh, especially without dilation as it's commonly done in, in clinical practice. And it requires extensive practice that most physicians are not receiving anymore in terms of medical school or their residency programs. In fact, uh, we know some data from various studies about some potential problems around this. Um, this is the TOS study, the, uh, uh, the, the, the denominator, the uh, ophthalmoscope and stethoscope say, and the question, the tendon hammer, I mean, and the, uh, and the question is, uh, you know, how often did a patient on the ward remember being examined by the tendon hammer, the ophthalmoscope, and the, and the um, stethoscope uh, when they were asked later on the ward? Well, let's start with the stethoscope, no surprise. 96% of people remembered that a physician had laid a stethoscope on them. And in terms of the ophthalmoscope, though, only 52% recalled being examined by the direct ophthalmoscope. And how, how did the ophthalmoscope fare compared to the tendon hammer? Not, not as well. About two thirds of folks remembered the uh, tendon hammer. And this is, neuro, this is on a neurologic ward. This is not just confined, obviously, to uh, 
this particular study that we just talked about, which was done in Edinburgh, this is a global problem. It's not just confined to neurology. This is uh, across various specialties. So only 11% of third year US medical students performed up when indicated about 50% of Canadian medical students had minimal confidence, 43% of UK ones lack confidence. And uh, in one survey of hospital physicians, while every one of them said it was important, only three of the 72 claimed to do it routinely. And then when folks looked behind them to see how often they were documenting it, they only documented it on 3% of patients. So we thought we might be able to help with a technology that has been uh, come, has come out of ophthalmology and optometry primarily from the perspective of diabetic retinopathy screen. This is non-madratic fundus photography. It's uh, a slit line style device. You put your chin up in the chin rest and, and put your head up against the bars as, you, as you've all done at some point, I'm sure, by visiting an eye care specialist. The advantage of this is that it can be done, the, thick, the pictures can be done by non-ophthalmic experts. You do not have to dilate the eye and uh, it's able to take quality photographs of the posterior pole. For those of you who've had the, the benefit of doing direct ophthalmoscopy, you, you know what it's like. You're wandering around the back of the eye trying to uh, put the pieces together. This is the field of view of a direct ophthalmoscope, and this is part of what makes it so difficult. Even if you're technically skilled, you still have to be able to have a systematic way to scan. You have to kind of keep everything in your memory, uh, and something that's actually big can sometimes be hard to detect because it's, it's bigger than the field of view. Uh, and there's a lot of variation in a normal retina. But this is the view that you get from a non-madratic fundus camera. Again, this was taken undilated. Uh, and uh, it's a beautiful picture of the entire posterior pole of the eye, in this case, a normal eye. Of course, uh, whenever a new you know, technology comes out or, or people are just gonna use photographs to look in the back of the eye, is that, is that really okay? Is, uh, isn't an eye doctor better at doing this or, or a professional fundus photographer, et cetera? Well, uh, trained uh, ophthalmic photographers with 20 years of experience versus two non-professionals with two days and one hour of training, uh, retina specialists couldn't tell the difference between uh, the images that, uh, that the folks were taking uh, with these cameras. Uh, from a, the perspective of diabetic retinopathy screening, it actually has higher sensitivity specificity and better inter-examination agreement even amongst ophthalmologists. So photographs are helpful to uh, ophthalmologists as well. So yes, we can use these photographs for clinical um, diagnosis and in fact uh, they may be uh, better because they, they free the frame, you're able to, to look at them and beyond that as We'll, as we'll talk about, there's opportunities for uh, telemedicine and other ways of, of getting extra input on these photos versus having to examine the patient in person. And then we decided to apply it to the emergency department because we thought that's a place where we might be able to help the most. Patients come there with acute problems, but there's all these challenges, right? A fast-paced environment, there's no way to turn off the lights. I mean, it is impossible to turn off the lights in the emergency department. Um, there are large teams, they're on uh, shift work, and to be accepted with this technology, we had to stay out of the way and help these guys do their job fast, which is what they want to accomplish. So we, des we designed a study called the PHOTOED study, um, which stands for the Fundus Photography versus Ophthalmoscopy Trial Outcomes in the Emergency Department. And what what we set out to do was systematically photograph all adult patients presenting to the Emory University Emergency Department with headache, acute focal neurologic deficits, diastolic, that's diastolic blood pressure greater than 120, or acute visual changes. And we divided the study in, into two phases. In one study, in, in the first phase, we uh, examined the, the ED doctors only had access to direct ophthalmoscopy. We were watching kind of how they were using the direct ophthalmoscope, how much they were using the direct ophthalmoscope. Um, we even went into some of the rooms that, that uh, the patients are in and figured out how many of them were broken, et cetera. Um, most, you know, quite a few rooms don't even have a functioning direct ophthalmoscope in them. Um, and then in the second phase, we uh, permitted the ER doctors to have access to the undilated fundus photographs. 
Uh, and in both phases, we uh, were uh, reading these photographs within 24 hours to make sure that there were no safety issues. And in fact, we were generally reading these images in, in nearly uh, real time, but, um, but just for you know, various reasons, gave us, some, gave us a window of time to, to deal with things. So what we defined as the primary outcome of the study was what we termed relevant findings. These are not just that a patient comes into the ER and has refractive error or has a large cup to disc ratio that might mean they have glaucoma. These are all findings that we felt should change something about the patient's care in the ED, even if that's just arranging follow-up for them. And we compared the ED physician's detection rate for these relevant findings in the two phases. Now we chose this two-phase design, and we could talk some about various designs we could choose um, to avoid influencing the physician behavior as much as possible during the first phase, because of the Hawthorne effect, the effect of being observed on your performance. And these are the relevant findings. So optic disc edema and isolated uh, retinal hemorrhage, uh, grade three, four hypertensive retinopathy, uh, retinal vascular occlusions, such as uh, a central retinal artery occlusion, as in this picture, or a um, or even a, a venous occlusion, and uh, optic disc pallor. So our overall goals were to demonstrate that this was better, uh, whether we were the ones doing the reading or the ED doctors were the ones reading and then describe the feasibility of the ED nurse practitioners who did this in the first phase of obtaining quality photographs under routine uh, conditions. So here are the overall results of these two phases of the studies. Of the studies. And um, basically in phase one, again, they only had direct ophthalmoscopy. They looked at 48 of the 358 patients we enrolled. Uh, that's only 14%, and they detected none of the abnormalities uh, themselves. Uh, of, of course, they recognized in some cases that there was a, you know, some ocular problem likely going on and got an ophthalmology consult. In phase two, uh, they had access to the non madratic uh, photographs. And in this case, uh, the, the photographs were uploaded into the medical record, and, uh, and they looked at them 68% of the time. We were able to verify that. Uh, through their forms and, uh, and so forth that they, they submitted. And then uh, they actually found almost half of the abnormalities that were found in the second phase of the study amongst these patients. Now, of course, we had enriched our uh, patient population through the, the complaints that we saw, but those are the complaints that, that typically, I would say, require a, an eye examination. And there's a large proportion of those patients that merely had isolated headache. Uh, and yet, you know, we found a, a, even shocking to us, percentage of patients who had one of these relevant findings, over 10% uh, out of the 704 patients uh, we, we were just talking about from the two phases of the study. And here's the breakdown that you see. The, about 30% with intraocular uh, hemorrhages, uh, 24% with disc edema, 20% with uh, malignant hypertension, 24% disc power, and 9% with an arterial vascular occlusion. The good news was this doesn't take very much time. The photo photography session itself only took a median of about two minutes. Now that doesn't include the time it took to put the patient in the wheelchair, roll them over to the camera, et cetera. But again, from the amount of time that the many hours that the, the median patient spends in the ED visit, uh, you can see this really is not uh, a huge time sink for them. And you see um, from an ease, speed, and comfort uh, scale rating uh, from the patients and nurses um, on a 10-point scale, you see that this received very good satisfaction scores from everyone, including the folks taking the pictures. So. In the, the second phase, um, the photographs were really helpful to the ER doctors, and it wasn't just when they're abnormal. They actually reported that the photographs were helpful over half of the time that, uh, of the, amongst the ones they reviewed. Uh, 
And, and that means that they were commonly helpful when they were normal. And amongst the comments that we got back from the ER is often they see a patient with headache or a shunt failure, and they want to be sure that there's no increased intracranial pressure. And this was a, a way to do that. And so this helped them rule out papilledema and feel comfortable about it, which they didn't feel prior to having access to these photos. Uh, the article today talks a little bit uh, more in depth about a, a couple of neurologic conditions that we studied. The first was headache. Um, amongst the, the patients in those first two phases of the study, there were about 500 with headache. Um, and there were 42 abnormalities amongst those patients. You can see the breakdown there is across the in, entire gamut, basically, of various abnormal findings. And uh, what I think is so important uh, to hammer home is that about 30 of those five, 30 of those 42 findings occurred among the 400 patients whose only complaint to the emergency room was a headache. Uh, we, we tell this to our neurology residents um, that the fundoscopic examination is very important amongst patients with headache, but again, um, I think this really drives that point home. So, and the 12 of the, of the remaining uh, 97 patients had one or more additional complaints, for example, vision loss, or they had an elevated blood pressure when they arrived in the ER. What you see in terms of the risk factors for uh, patients having an abnormal fundus uh, amongst the headache patients was a lower risk as they got older. Uh, so again, this was tended to be the younger patients in our uh, on our set, the ones that are actually on average a little less likely to have secondary headache. Um, and then you've got the high body mass index likely representing uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension amongst these patients. And then blood pressure was um, another uh, finding that as the blood pressure increased, they were more likely in the setting of headache uh, to have an abnormal fundus. And we could talk um, maybe in the questions if people are interested about that, because typically, although patients and, and some, uh, some have, have learned along the way that, that headache is a sign of hypertension, uh, there's some caveats to that. And so this was an interesting finding, and it's, it might warrant some further discussion, but uh, in the sake of time, I'm going to move on for the moment. Um, so just to, to discuss a few of the things, um, Again, high frequency of otherwise normal physical examinations in these patients with the exception of their fundus photography. Uh, even amongst those with abnormal uh, fundi, 40%, um, those with normal neuroimaging for, uh, had 40% of the abnormal fundi. So, and uh, again, it emphasizes how important it is to look at, at our patients and, and especially younger patients. Now, these isolated retinal hemorrhages are also interesting uh, from a hypertension perspective because uh, when combined with the grade three, four hypertensive retinopathy and some other, other evidence that these isolated retinal hemorrhages are actually likely due to hypertension, um, or at least primarily due to hypertension, this composed nearly half of the patients with abnormal fundi presenting uh, to the emergency room. I think there's um, some more work to be, be done on this. So the second condition that we, we studied uh, in a little bit more depth that was part of the article was cerebrovascular disease. And as I pointed out at the beginning of the talk, these, have long, uh, these are known to have long-term prognostic value. So we wanted to know, does it have any, is there any evidence that these would be valuable for risk stratification of patients presenting with possible uh, TIA or stroke to the emergency department in the short term? And so we uh, used the ERIC study grid, the, the atherosclerosis risk and community study we talked about briefly earlier. And um, we found that 56% of the patients who presented with a focal neurologic deficit, that was 257, had a, a retinal microvascular finding. And that included um, greater than or two sectors of focal narrowing, uh, and you can, and greater than four sectors of generalized narrowing was how we define it. And you see that there's a clear dose response from other patients, those who um, had, were diagnosed finally with a TIA and those who were diagnosed with stroke. So there was some suggestion of something uh, might be going on here. And even after controlling for age, blood pressure, diabetes, clinical presentation, duration of symptoms, and whether they had MRI diffusion weighted uh, positivity on their scan, uh, we see that these uh, 
in our st remain independent risk factors. And it turns out that that list of, of um, signs and symptoms uh, in the first list is the um, commonly uh, used ABCD2 score for um, giving some risk stratification to patients presenting with TIA. So it looked like maybe this could add something to that. Um, and then we even specifically excluded the stroke patients, controlled for the ABCD2 score, uh, and all of those were still significantly associated with TIA. So maybe we need the ABCD2E or I score, uh, either, either one will work, um, to help us a little bit further. And in fact, we are um, in the process of, of studying that with a cohort study that hopefully will be completed uh, about middle of next year. So this was obviously retrospective and still doesn't answer the key question of whether I can tell you, yes, this is one, this patient probably needs to go in the hospital, this patient's probably gonna go home and do okay. And as I said, we're, we're targeting a project of that question. So I also think this raises some important issues that we briefly touch on in uh, the article about medical education. Um, obviously people still in curricula and, um, you know, required, um, you know, features of curriculum by the ACGME and various organizations is teaching ophthalmoscopy. And I guess the question is, should maybe we be focusing on interpreting these fundus photographs instead, and should we find ways to, to get these cameras out there? Um, in this longitudinal study by uh, Lippa and all, there was um, a sustained multi-year ophthalmology curriculum uh, quite unusual for medical school uh, medical schools that went you know over all four years and even with that uh, you had about over 10 percent of students saying it wasn't important and and only a quarter of the students had actually purchased an ophthalmoscope before graduation and then I guess we can even ask do, does the general physician of the future need fundus interpretation skills there are uh, cons there's considerable work in this field uh, around um, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, one study um, showed that 367 diabetic patients, the photos were read by non-physician uh, graders who received a, a year of training and yearly audits. Um, as well as family physicians with two hours of training plus uh, biennial re-education and then compared that to the retinal specialist. And you see that uh, the non- uh, and have a lot of other things to think about. And the non-physician graders had better sensitivity than the family uh, physicians. Then, uh, beyond that, we have a couple of articles I referenced down below that show that the automatic detection through primarily machine learning methodologies uh, is getting to be essentially comparable to an ophthalmologist in the detection and severity of, um, of diabetic retinopathy. And there's also some work on this in terms of the detection and severity assessment of optic disc edema. So imagine you just uh, have a, photo, a, a patient come in and part of, uh, right after they get their blood pressure, they get a photograph of the back of the eye, goes through one of these automatic detection schemes, and at least, you know, it's not going to be perfect. You're going to get a, a readout uh, like you do on the EKG machine. That's, that's not, you know, a perfect read, but at least it gives you some direction of whether it's normal or abnormal. And, uh, and you're also able to look at the picture and, and draw your own uh, conclusions about it. And then uh, within a day or so, an ophthalmologist is going to look at that picture and make sure nothing else uh, was unusual. So I think we can apply some cardiology or radiology models to this, and uh, we can really make a difference in terms of patient care. There's also a lot of development in terms of uh, handheld uh, non-madratic cameras. As I was telling you, this is a tabletop device. Um, but hopefully, we're going to get to the point uh, where we have basically your iPhone doing this, and, and there are even some attachments that purport to do this, although I find them uh, quite challenging to use even, uh, again, being pretty experienced using things like direct ophthalmoscopes. Um, so it still needs some work, but there are handheld non drag cameras, uh, and they allow us to expand the patient population because unless you can sit up, you can't use one of these tabletop ones.
So I think the future is really bright in this area. I think there's a lot we can do to have a better diagnosis by incorporating uh, aspects of this into our clinic. And I'm going to, to quit there so we have plenty of time uh, for discussion. Uh, but some of your questions, I have some additional slides and things that, that, that may prompt things. So thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Bruce. We can open up this session for any questions or comments that the group may have. Well, while we wait for others to jump in, this is David. Uh, thanks, Bo. I always, always find this entertaining to see how it evolves over time. Um, <clears throat> let me ask you a, a, a couple of questions. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the pragmatics of implementing this and the sort of the, the logistics, the workflow, the financial barriers. In other words, are there are there reasons fundamentally why um, this isn't being done in every emergency department in the country today? Yes. I'll start and there. That, it's even a challenge in our own ED um, still to this day. And, um, you know, the first thing is, you know, most people walk up to me after a talk like this, David, and, and they say, you know, what camera do you have? Well, that's, that's the easy part. Um, and yes, there are financial barriers to it for sure. Um, one of those is that um, the cameras are still, uh, t uh, you know, probably around fifteen thousand dollars, ten to fifteen thousand dollars. They continue to come down in price since we started doing this. Um, and but you only, you know, again, you add up like the Emory Emergency Department is a uh, you know mini bed uh, you know I don't remember exactly how many but let's say there's you know 30 40 bed ER we're talking about here uh, and there's a $400 ophthalmoscope on the wall you get pretty close to that amount just taking the ophthalmoscopes and not buying them and maintaining them anymore and this is also again to just put it in perspective because it does sound like a lot of money and yes it is hard to you know convince folks to buy these things but we're talking about an ultrasound machine or an EKG machine. So, um, and we use those all the time in, in, in clinics. So um, this is not an outlandish expense. Um, and the training aspects of it are, are remarkably minimal. I mean, we, I have been able to, uh, we've been able to take uh, nurse practitioners taking good quality photographs. Um, and, you know, what we do is uh, we, you know, take, even just 10 or 15 minutes hands on with them after they've read through some materials, supervise them for the first few patients and, and they get it. I've had medical students who I have beyond giving them the written material. And then I, once you get some experience reading the pictures, I know what they're doing wrong and can actually coach them just by looking at the, the, the photographs that they take. Like they're, you're not centered enough. You need to push forward. You need to do X, Y, and Z. There are also cameras now, it's still in this price range we're talking about, that, that work like an auto refractor. If you've ever been to your eye doctor and they just put a machine in front of you and it spits out a glasses prescription and actually well, they line it up with one eye uh, and it automatically aligns, takes the picture and then it comes, it backs out and comes back, goes to your other eye and takes a picture of that sort of stuff. So there's those aspects. Um, finding a dark place to, to set the camera, we actually uh, had these custom hoods we used um, but again, we have good quality photos, and I'm not going to cover that too much. But, you know, I think the other thing is just getting over the barrier of, um, of making, you know, getting buy-in from the folks that matter. Um, and, and, you know, I think that we always had very strong support from chairs and, and clinical directors of the programs to do this. I also think that, um, but it's also, it's not just the top, it's the bottom, you know, because the nurse practitioners are tasked with seeing the headache patients primarily in our ER, the, what appears to be an uncomplicated headache. They don't get any training in examining the eye. And once they started realizing what they were missing, um, they're clamoring to have this, you know, as part of their, their toolkit because they don't even have experience with a direct ophthalmoscope. So that's a piece of it. And we always try to emphasize, you know, 
not how you know not how good they're necessarily doing but all the things that they're they're not missing that could have turned into disasters um in many cases and, and do uh i mean we had cases that um you know during the course of the study who had been to the to our er um you know four or five times with headache and have papilledema you know so that that's not a good um you know outcome so those kinds of things are a couple of the practical things um there's also you're going to have to have an engaged community of ophthalmologists um you know we mentioned the the training aspect of this and um i think i had a, a couple of slides about that too um from one of the other phases of the study so we try we, we tried to train the er doctors in a third phase of the study and what they wanted to do let's see if i can get the slides back up i hope i'm not taking too long answering Welcome this question Boy. That's not easy, was it? Um, they wanted to be trained the way that they're normally trained, which is usually through short webinars and everything. This is the ER doctors again. So we did a we we created a, a training for them, um, and uh, you know it helped them learn the difference between uh, you know just normal fundi, uh, some some not so subtle. Uh, abnormalities uh, versus the subtle version of those same abnormalities. Um, a lot of common artifacts that they were calling abnormal, in this case some reflections and so forth. And we included another 587 patients in this and found a, a quite a similar rate of abnormalities. But the key to this is that, you know, it, even if these are busy ER doctors, these are the core physicians. These are the guys who, who work in the Emory ER uh, frequently. Like the, I don't remember what our exact definition was, but these are the guys who are pretty much there every week. There's a whole group of, of other physicians who you know, are 90% research and come do their month, basically, of emergency care, and they're hard to catch. And we could only get 87% with their boss telling them this was mandatory uh, for them to do. Um, and uh and you know of course so and, and these these guys did these guys only evaluated 61 percent of the patients who we had photographs on and they, they spent about 30 minutes on this on uh on average uh for this training and that's about what they're willing to tolerate and what we see is that their test scores yeah got a little bit better not significantly so but it didn't really change their behavior pre and post training they, they still reviewed about the same amount and got about the same number of abnormals and, and normals right. And then if you even compare them to the trained versus untrained, yes, they reviewed, the ones that were trained reviewed images more frequently, but that was a pre-training thing. They already were reviewing about 50% of the photos before they did the training. So it's just that this group was more engaged to begin with, and, and really the untrained people, apparently our training wasn't that good because it didn't really help um, the untrained, uh, you know, to help the trained people do that much better. But this was the amount of time they were willing to spend on this. So I think this is a huge challenge too. And it, it, it indicates to, to us that you're still going to need to be over reading these photographs. So then you've got to have that engaged that engaged ophthalmology group that's willing to review these pictures. And then the challenge is, how are you gonna pay these people to do this? Uh, you know, because there's no, um, there's no CPT code that really works for this activity. Um, fund fundus photographs typically need, in routine care, typically need a diagnosis that was the reason that you took the picture to yeah. begin with. You're right. So that's a big problem. And the, the telemedicine codes and the screening codes are not designed for patients with complaints like headache. It's designed for people with known retinal disease who already have diabetic retinopathy, et cetera, et cetera, diagnosed by somebody looking in the back of their eye. So we need new CPT codes or new models um, of clinical care to, to put this into practice. So there's a bunch of stuff that for the stars to align to make this work, even though I think, you know, pe this has gotten people extraordinarily excited. And then they kind of, they get home and they realize, hmm, 
there's a lot of stuff that makes this super challenging. <laughs> right. Well, uh, we, we're, we're very familiar with all of those roadblocks since we've been trying to do the same thing around dizzy patients and eye movement. Um, that's really helpful. Thank you, Bo. Um, I'll just comment briefly that SIDM is working hard on the policy front to try to um, work with CMS and other groups to sort of make this diagnostic process better and easier. There may be some windows of opportunity in this sort of changing environment where CMS is changing some of the telemedicine related codes next year for us to kind of uh, help them understand that you have to think about this from a diagnostic frame, not just from a, a treatment frame. And that right. they can't, you know, they have a specific thing where they're expanding interpretation of videos and, and images as part of the telemedicine. Hopefully, they're going to open that up so that it's not just given a specific disease, but instead is um, for the purposes of diagnosing disease. Um, I think we have a, a, a write-in question. Yes. Uh, yeah, and so I'll, I'll read that to you, Dr. Bruce. Um, it says, in 1974, every medical student had a free Welsh Allen scope provided by pharma uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies. Do you think that the lack of an ophthalmoscope is the reason that the exam has gone by wayside? Um, I don't think it's only that. Um, we also did a little bit of work with our medical students to try to figure some of this, some of this stuff out. And um, and basically, um, you know, when we we first just use these heads here, um, they have a lens and and everything. It, it really is a nice experience of of what it's like because you you know when you're using an ophthalmoscope, you don't really move like in a plane. You move more in a a parabola, um, and the lens forces that in these models that we we created. And then they have hair and stuff. You got you know, and you got to get up up close and personal with them uh, to to do ophthalmoscopy right. So. Um, you know, basically, they really liked uh, the fundus photographs, though. You know, and they even liked it better than examining their own friends. Um, and so they they said they would love to have photos. Well, we we came back a year later just to see how they were doing, and um, seventy five percent of them had you know it was a little bit of a weird question, but seventy five percent of them less than twenty percent of the time had examined the, a patient's fundus when they knew they they ought to. 80% 80, 80 still felt uncomfortable, but what I think, and, and then about less than half stated they would, uh, or let's 44% stated they would not perform ophthalmoscopy. And, 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 but what I found the most disturbing, I, I think, about the whole thing is that about a fifth of the students said they were actually discouraged, like directly discouraged by their clinical preceptor um, as the primary reason that they did not perform the examination. And so, perhaps in the in the um, interim, yes, maybe people not having ophthalmoscopes being experienced with them, but to go to active discouragement is, um, I think, more than just not having an ophthalmoscope. And I think that um, I think people, I, mean, I personally think that um, people have forgotten that this is. Uh, useful. Um, I think that in, in general medicine, um, and uh, I mean, you know, it's been a while, but I still remember being an intern and, you know, I was the unusual guy who carried his ophthalmoscope around. Um, and because I still found it to help me. But unless we can show people again that this helps, I, you know, I don't think that they're going to put in the effort. They, they think they can. They think they can solve the problem with an MRI scan. They think they can solve. Well, the the ER doctors, um, you know, why do I need this for hypertensive retinopathy when I can just check the creatinine? Well, because I found patients in your ER who have malignant hypertension that their creatinine is normal, um, and. Uh, you know, once they start to go, oh, okay, you know, now now we're talking. But then we even have problems in terms of 
yeah, we're, we're here to talk about diagnosis, but especially for malignant hypertension, I mean, the papers I read say those patients belong in the ICU, but that doesn't seem to be clinical practice. Um, as part of my, and as part of my dissertation, you know, uh, research, uh, you know, that was involved with some of this, re this project, we found increased mortality amongst those people who had uh, abnormal fundus findings. I mean, from whatever cause, maybe they were hit by a bike a week later, you know, after they, uh, you know, left the ER for all we know. But, but you know, it can't be all the explanation for, for why these, the patients with fundus photography abnormal in the ER and those that didn't, and, and they just, they just ended up dying more frequently in the, in the future. Um, so there's something that, this is a fundamental, you know, place, the only place. You have direct access to, to brain, to blood vessels, um, and, and you have the opportunity to, to see how healthy they are um, without any of that fancy stuff. And I think we've lost, I think we've just lost the knowledge that this is so uh, valuable to general medicine. I think it's, and I think it's more than free ophthalmoscopes. And if I could just comment, just to reinforce what Bo just said, um, you know, as a neuro-ophthalmologist, I've sort of lived this. Um, as the neurology clerkship director, we actually tried to get the students to look at the fundi. And the problem is even worse than Bo is describing it, because what happened was we, we required that for each week they were on the inpatient rotation, that one patient per week they needed to do a dilated fundus exam. and the the rule was you had to look through an undilated pupil first then w with the direct ophthalmoscope then you had to dilate the eye and then you had to look to see whether you saw what you thought you saw because that's really the only way that the only people who who get serious training in the use of the direct ophthalmoscope are neuro ophthalmologists who do that essentially as part of their training even ophthalmologists are sometimes iffy with the direct ophthalmoscope because they're so accustomed to almost 100% of patients looking through a dilated pupil mm -hmm. uh, with an indirect ophthalmoscope or a slit lamp. So we had them do that and there was a huge outcry from the neurology attendings, uh, at least half of them, it was sort of split the audience. Half of the neurologists were like, go Dave, this is great, this is a wonderful, this is the way things used to be, you know, bedside medicine at its best. And the other half basically screamed that this was awful. And when we asked around what was awful about it, basically was that the, the students were effectively embarrassing the attendings by asking them to look at people's fundi when they themselves, the <laughs> neurology attendings, had no idea what they were looking at. So the, I, I think this is, an, I'm not sure that this is a lost art in the sense that I'm not sure it was ever gained by the vast majority of physicians. I mean, if you sort of look at the, the, the panoply of history, I don't think there was a time in medicine where more than 50% of physicians were totally competent at looking at people's fundi. I, I'm not sure there was sort of a golden age of direct ophthalmoscopy, although there was definitely a golden age where people looked uh, more often than they do now. I'm not sure there were ever really that many well-trained individuals. And I think it is a hard skill to learn. I suspect that what you're doing, Bo, which is to essentially leverage the technology to make the process of looking at the fundus easier is ultimately the right solution rather than trying to ask people to do the two-step in. They have to do, you know, right now it's a three-step problem, right? It's, they have to believe it's important. They have to know how to use the direct ophthalmoscope and they have to know what they're looking at right. through a, a, a complex, small pinhole, you know, keyhole. Exactly. You're trying to reduce that by one to get them to understand the importance of the problem and then interpret a photograph. Uh, and I think that that is a critical step towards making it easier, but it's not going to be enough by itself. And I think ultimately you're going to need a lot more ophthalmologists on board who can, you know, not just overread, but potentially be on call to, to read these on a regular basis. Yes. And I mean, I think that, you know, uh, you know, ophthalmologists are generally on board. I mean, I've given this, uh, given some versions of these talks to, to uh, you know, state ophthalmology societies and ophthalmology conferences. And yeah, I, one thing that just sticks in my head was uh, a, a poor 
it's completely kind of unrelated, but at the same time, he, he was interested beyond just the story, but he was like, he, he, he had gotten called in to examine a patient in the middle of the night um, who also had some neurologic stuff going on. And, and he walked in and, and the neurologist was examining the patient over the robot, um, you know, with the telemedicine. And he's like, I can't believe, like, here I am, and, and this, this other neurologist is, like, sitting in, at home, like, examining this patient. And to make the story worse, you know, the patient, you know, you got to get in people's face with this stuff, accused him of sexual harassment um, uh, for looking in the back of the what, The one with the robot or the, or the one without the robot? <laughs> right. The, the same patient. There was this robot patient. It was the same patient. And he was like, if I hadn't had to come in and I could have examined the patient with a photograph, this, this whole situation would never have happened. And so there was that aspect of it. But he's also like, yeah, I mean, I did not need to go in in the middle of the night to see the patient um, if I had a photograph. Um, you know, you can't rule out everything, obviously, with a photograph. But you can, if, if the question is, and I think it was in this particular instance, is there papilledema or not? You can answer that question. At least, is there papilledema of severity warranting, you know, you know, absolute immediate, you know, do something about it, kind of stuff. So, um, and I and our residents feel the same way. Like they get called in to rule out papilledema in the middle of the night. And they're like, "There's a camera over there. Can you get somebody to snap a photo of them?" Um, and and email it. And we have a HIPAA compliant email system. So we did a lot of our review over over email. Um, and, you know, they're in the medical record, too. We put them in both places, but it's nice to just, you know, somebody just shoots your picture. No, that looks fine. I'll see them tomorrow, and we'll figure out what's going on. Yeah. Dr. Bruce, is there any data on what the uptake has been nationwide, either for the use of photography in emergency rooms or uh, neurology clinics, ophthalmology clinics, th places like that? Um, I don't know of any, you know, like systematic look at that. I mean, we and my colleagues who've worked on this project tend to get, you know, people asking us, like, the practical aspects of things. And so I, I know it's not great. Um, although I know that, um, you know, I hear through the grapevine, though, of other places doing it that, you know, didn't, of course, contact us. Um, and, but I don't have a good sense of that. Um, I think it's, uh, from what I can tell, it's a little bit better in, um, in the, in, in, um, ERs, uh, and less so in neurology clinics, although our neurology clinic, uh, at Emory does have cameras, but it's a very, you know, again, it's a very large multi-specialty practice, uh, who, you know, again, has the right attitude about safety, um, that, you know, we'd rather prevent a disaster with a $25,000 camera if it costs that and paying somebody to learn to use it than the multi-million dollar lawsuit plus the poor patient, obviously much more important, who lost vision. So, um, or had a catastrophic neurologic outcome, God forbid. So, yeah, I mean, that, if we could get that part through folks' head, too, I mean, I, you know, I think there'd be a lot more of these uh, cameras and neurology clinics and other, and other places. I mean, having unfortunately been involved in, in medical legal cases around papilledema, those are, I mean, against neurologists, against ER doctors, you know, that's not a position you, you want to be in. And I think that far too many people are, um, just getting lucky, especially given, especially what we're seeing from the amount of, of papilledema you are seeing in the ER um, amongst patients with headache or other neurologic complaints. Um, you're just you're just getting lucky that somehow that hasn't come back to you. And so it's not just, and this is another problem I think we have in medicine. There's very little feedback about you know, what you missed. And I think, again, I think if 
if there was better feedback, especially to the ER, for example, I think there's some programs to, to try to improve that in many, many centers. And I know some folks have been working on that, but um, we need more of that. Because if you don't know that, you, you know, you, you keep hearing that your patients go to the eye doctor later and they have papilledema and you've been seeing hey patients for a while, it would, it would scare you, I think. And we have one, one last question maybe before we end this session, which relates to pediatric populations and how, um, let me see here, uh, what you think the role of video imaging, oh, sorry, it, there's one before, uh, what the possibilities for pediatric patients are with fundus photography. Yeah, so we actually did this study too, to some extent. We didn't do it in the ER, but we did do it in our PEDS ophthalmology clinic where the pediatric ophthalmologist will tell you it is very difficult to examine the fundi of children. Uh, the bottom line is you can do this on children. In fact, um, the, I, I don't have all the data right at my, you know, on my fingertips in my head or right on the tip of my tongue, so to speak, but it's, um, we were able to photograph one two-year-old who was pretty cooperative um, and, um, in addition to that, um, on our like median age that we were able to get good quality photographs was, I believe, one or two years younger than the age at which uh, either the either the either uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics or um, the the ophthalmology version of that um, says that you should be able to get a direct ophthalmoscope exam on. So. Um, and, and and it's frozen, like, you know, again, again, so once you have it, once you get a picture, you know, even if it takes you five tries, um, you've got it. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't, the kid doesn't need to go through it five times. Now, if I recall correctly, we did dilate, uh, we did die, I wanna believe we dilated the children, but I, again, it's been a while since we did that study, but it was very promising and I think I, you know, whether I saw it in review or whether it actually was a manuscript I saw, you know, it gets a little hazy sometimes. But I've seen, um, if you look in the literature, you're prob probably going to find someone else who uh, did it in a pediatric ER because I remember seeing that study or reviewing it at some point uh, in the last year or two. So I think it, I think it has great promise for peds. Great. And then just one last question, uh, which is, since apparently there are many more issues in the cornea presenting to ERs, what's your opinion on the role of video imaging platforms incorporated into a standard ophthalmic split lamp? Yep. So there are folks that are working on both that as well as um, some portable OCT technologies and things. So I think all of this is just going to get better and better. I think that yeah, I mean, I think if you had a, a, a video camera, it's sort of like a yeah a split, you know, view of a slit lamp, and the ER doctor is you know good and trained at using the slit lamp usually, and so if the eye doctor can be looking looking through the same scope as you're doing it and get a sense of what's going on, again, in many cases, it can say the physician the time of going in to, to examine the patient. They can just come to the clinic the next day. It can save the patient sitting in the ER waiting for the consultant to get there. Um, and, and the patient, you know, uh, is going to feel a lot more, uh, you know, well taken care of. So I, th these kinds of things answer a lot of the, you know, it, medicine for better or worse says, has, has an aspect now of, of customer service, which we could talk about all day. Um, there are good aspects of that, of course, and there are bad ones. But again, even from patient satisfaction, right? If that were our only concern, um, something like that would be very beneficial and is definitely doable. I mean, with today's technology, I think there's, there's no question that they, they could be looking at it live with you. Uh, and if not, you could take a video and, and um, send it to them over, over a file share or whatever very easily, and that would be great.
Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bruce. I think we've come to the end of our time. Um, and thank you for everyone for joining in on the conversation. If you have any recommendations for upcoming journal club uh, articles or presenters, please feel free to send us those uh, suggestions.